Hi everybody, I'm Tim Bulot. Welcome to another edition of Training to Survive. Tonight we have episode number nine. We're almost towards the end of our, our first season here. We got a great lineup for you tonight. We're going to start things out with our video archives. George Parolsky did a demonstration of the Los Cotas of Judo for us a few shows back. Tonight he's going to go through the actual application and explanation of all the moves that he demonstrated in the Kata. So go back and look at that show from the past. It's a few weeks back. Go look at the old shows. You can find it. Look at the Los Cotas of Judo episode one because tonight we've got episode two. After that, Officer Rick Cutler is going to talk to us briefly about child safety. Then we're going to get into kind of a nostalgic interview where we talk with one of our instructors at the Academy of Kempo Karate back in about 1996 about cardio karate, which was all the craze back in the days. I wouldn't do it now so much, but back then it was a, it was a big hit. On the mat, with me, of course, we're going to look at multiple attackers, and to wrap things up, we've got modern martial arts. Again, on this show, we're excited to bring that to you. We've been up in Denton, Texas, working with uh, Mr. Mark Redding and his crew up there. Tonight, we're going to look at Jeet Kune Do trapping, so we'll get into that a little bit later at the end of the show. So hang in there with us. It's going to be a great show tonight. Let's get this thing going. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Bulot. Welcome to another exciting edition of Training to Survive. We've got a great show lined up for you today. We've got a rare treat coming up with the Lost Cottas of Judo, George Porowski from upstate New York. He's got some great and exciting information on ancient Judo Cottas. Stay tuned for that. When people refer to the art of Judo, most of us think of tournaments and some form of wrestling. Judo at one time was an extremely effective art designed and used in the ancient battlefields of feudal Japan. When I met with George Porowski, he put on an excellent demonstration of traditional Judo. So what we're going to do now is step back about 300 years into the past. We're going to examine some of the lost katas of Judo and let Mr. Porowski show us what Judo was actually all about. We will now be detailing the explanations to the Go no Kata, beginning with the Omote, or beginning frontal techniques. The opponent attacks with Yakuzuki, a reverse punch. My response is an inside Uchiuki, reverse punch of my own, and a knee strike. In the air, that would mean I slide forward to block, punch, knee. Again, I'm not retreating, but I'm sliding forward and blocking, keeping my elbow at my center, punching with hip rotation, and sending a knee. Again, block, punch, knee. I then reach around his back while my leg is still up. I'll cut the outside of his leg and throw my body weight to create throwing action. Technique number two. In technique number two, your, my opponent is attacking with oizuk, which is a lunging punch. Because he's doing an oizuk, I can't meet him head on or this occurs. So instead, I have to retreat from him. My retreating action in this is to block and keep a dodge, shift my weight forward and apply an elbow. I then grab him, pull him, and apply a shihonage, checking the angle. Q 
securing my grip on his body with my feet, holding on to the wrist with my thumb, and my center wrenching it by turning the arm in a counterclockwise position. Technique number three. The attack this time is Megari Kayage, the front kick. My response is a Sukuyuki, scooping block. I then do a Jujuyuki reposition, catch, front kick of my own. Again, block, crossover, front kick of my own. Lock, catch, front kick. Now I slide up to grab my opponent, regress, and sweep his support leg. We will now do number four. Watch the formality as I approach my attacker. I step to the outside, pivot, step, he grabs me and pulls me back into position. My response is to lift my leg. Do Ushirogari or rear kick. Let's take it at this angle. Approach my attacker. Pivot, step, I get pulled back and reposition myself. Chamber, kick. I slide up underneath the arm. Apply the arm to take him down and use the lock by holding on to his. Hand, all I have to do is move my leg forward. One more time on the duck under. This angle. Kick. I'm ducking here. Applying the arm lock. Elbows right in the front position. Okay, technique number five. We both meet each other in the middle. We are in Hachichi Dach, foot positions. He grasps my wrist. I apply a Gidambarai as I step forward to pull the wrist off. My Uke steps forward with the pull. I then apply what's called Kagizuk to the kidney. I reach around, go to Seiza, pull my opponent over my body, and apply a Tate Zuk into the groin. One, two, three. Grasp, pull him over my body, punch. And this again, the details of the hands. Gidambarai, Kagi, Ampi, grab, and prepare to duck. One, two, three, prepare to duck. Okay, number six. I walk to my opponent and perform a box step as I'm directly behind, uh, he's directly behind me. I step forward, as I'm stepping forward, he grasps my wrist and pulls me back. I'm going to circle by moving my wrists in towards my center, lift my leg for momentum, and punch the opponent in the ribs with a Heiko Zook. Now the kata itself punches straight under the arms to prevent punching them in the ribs. Again. Another angle. The attack this time is an oizuk. I'm going to sidestep. The sidestepping motion is called yoko kawashi. Now I'm not just sidestepping them. I'm coming in with an attack of my own. My attacking weapon is, an, uh, is a ridge hand. And to guarantee I don't get hit, I push the hand off to the side before I strike. In the air, it would be Then turn my hand, take him down. My elbows, I mean my knees, 
clasp his elbow and wrenches up. Other angle. Number eight. Number eight, I walk to my opponent, pivot off to the side. Step, he grabs and returns. Unlike the rear kick, this kick turns first to the side and then uses a scooping action into, into, the, rib, uh, into the groin or abdominal region. Again, I turn using the sole of my feet, hook in, come around, choke. I then do what's called Osoto Garuma, I'm lifting his hip cage with my hip cage, driving my punch to the temple. Let's do it with another angle. Hey. Okay, we're going on to number nine. The attack on number nine, again, is an Oizuk. I'm using a Yoko Kawashi to step off to the side. My counter attack is a Teisho Uchi or a palm heel strike. From the other angle, to guarantee though that the Kawashi is useful, it'll be pushed away with my hand prior to striking. I then am going to grasp and simply pull my opponent down. Step around him, grasp his collar, and apply Okuri Irijime. Kuri may applies a choke using a downward pressure with this cow, cross pressure here with two way action of the hands applying a choke. Again. Okay, we're going to move on to number 10. Number 10 utilizes the judo chop. Remember, before karate called it the karate chop, it was the judo chop in the 1950s. And this motion of applying the knife hand strike to the collarbone was a trademark of the so-called judo chop. It's preserved in this kata. As the opponent applies a choke, you're going to use an upward action on the choke, holding here, applying a tate zuk to the abdominals. The first knife hand comes across the neck, and then one, two, three, to guarantee breaking the collarbone. Knee into the groin, place your foot down, koshigaruma, punch to the head. Single. And one more time with a close up on the hand action. Blocking, punching, knife hand, one, notice I return to chamber just like in Shotokan Karate, two, three, knee, throw, punch. Number 11, last in the Omote Waza series. This time before the opponent applies the choke, I'm going to be hitting his hands away and applying uh, Hasumizuki or scissor punch. As I do that, I, I jump and drop into Kibidachi. My feet then come together as I come out, come bring my feet back apart and throw. So it looks like this, literally. One, two. It's like you're doing jumping jacks. One, two. One. Hello, I'm Officer Rick Cutler of the Irving Police Department. Back with you again this week to provide you another crime prevention tip. This week we're going to talk about keeping your child safe in a vehicle. Parents, we all know when driving we need to keep our child in a car safety seat or seat belt, and we do know that Texas law requires that. From the ages of zero to two years of age, our child needs to be in a car seat. From the ages of two to four, they need to be in a car seat 
our seat belt. From 4 to 14, they need to be in a seat belt, period. The best way to protect, protect an infant child is to place them in a semi-reclined, rear-facing car safety seat, which is securely fashioned by a seat belt. The best way to protect a toddler up to 40 pounds is to place them in a front-facing semi-reclined car seat and also have it anchored by a seat belt. Parents, if we follow these basic rules and these basic laws set up by the state of Texas and we're involved in an accident, it should greatly reduce the risk of injury to our child or even ourselves. That's our crime prevention tip for this week. Enjoy the rest of the show and see you next time. So up until now, we've been looking at various types of attacks and we went over categories of attack a little bit earlier in one of the earlier shows and we're teaching various techniques to cover these attacks. Now tonight uh, we're going to go back to about 1994 is when I actually filmed this piece. Okay, this was filmed at uh, our old school that was at uh, Rochelle and, and uh, MacArthur, okay, where we actually we actually started there and uh, we're looking at using basically pieces of Kempo techniques against multiple attackers. Now, now this is a drill, and this is a drill that I've, I've, I've run for a, a long time, and I still use it today, because understanding Kempo is knowing that the techniques are there to teach you certain actions uh, that can be used in, in an altercation. But the students got to understand that the odds of doing a technique in its in its entirety is that that's impossible. Okay, and the, an opponent is not going to maintain that position for you. But it's just a drill, no more than a boxer working a set combination on a heavy bag. The heavy bag's not moving, but it allows him to hardwire those moves, those techniques into his uh, into his reaction. Okay, it's the same way with Kempo. We just use individuals for that. In this demonstration, we're going to look at using pieces of techniques as opponents shift in and out of range during a multiple attack scenario. Now, once again, it's just a scenario. It's just a drill, okay? And these can be shifted, modified, tailored, uh, chopped up any way you want to work a variety of different angles. But this is just to kind of expose the student that as at a yellow belt level, we do this at, at, at a yellow belt level on how to take their their learned techniques, those named techniques, and use them, uh, or I should say practice them against a multiple attack scenario. Let's get into it. As you become more advanced in the art, you should always, always continue to practice and reiterate on things that you learn at the lower belt levels. Now the techniques and the information and the techniques that are going to help you become more spontaneous are going to come from those lower rank techniques first versus the higher rank techniques. They should become more familiar to you. They should become more ingrained into your memory, into your vocabulary of motion. And what I'm going to do here is show you an interesting way to stay proficient with some of those lower belt techniques and work on your environmental skills as well. Okay, now we're going to take yellow belt techniques and we're going to work against three attackers in this situation. Gentlemen, come on in. Okay. Now in this scenario, these three guys are going to be lined up to me, basically three abreast. Brian may be a little bit closer, whereas these guys may be in slightly. But we're going to take techniques strictly out of yellow belt, and I'm going to show you how to use parts of the technique intermittently, okay, to help build continuity in your motion, help you to teach you to pick and choose targets at random, and help you become more familiar with these techniques, okay? So the first attack is gonna come from Brian. He's leading this pack here, so he's gonna initiate the action. He's gonna step in with a two-hand push, and I'm gonna drop back and start a technique, alternating maces that we already know. I'll do my block and my punch, and as I hit him, I knock him out of range, but his buddy comes into the rescue. So Mike's gonna grab at this point, and he's gonna offer, or he's gonna pull. So as he pulls, I'm gonna step and hit for sword and hammer. And I notice I did not finish alternating maces. I didn't need to, so I took the motion that would have been a back knuckle, and I used it to chop Mike in this situation. I drop down, catch the groin, and at this point, his buddy's stepping through with a right step through punch. Okay, I'm going to drop back and use my technique attacking mace. Okay, and I notice how I've got him positioned. I've already started using Chuck as a shield. I've got a pretty good border between me and these other two opponents, and the border is Chuck. So I block and I'm going to continue to attack him with my thrust punch, but at this situation, suppose my thrust punch was powerful enough to take Chuck out of the situation for a second, and Brian's coming to the rescue here. So I'm going to finish attacking Mace 
but I'm not going to finish it on Chuck. My next move in attacking Mace is a kick, so I'm going to take the kick, pop, and I'm going to use it to Brian and use the punch to the face at this point. Mike's back on his feet. He's active again. I'm exposed. He's going to come in with a kick. Go ahead. The technique, the reflecting hammer works well here. Now Chuck's somewhat confused. He's seen his buddies fall. He's coming to the rescue once again, but he's not sure what he's going to do. Okay, he didn't want to leave him hanging, but on the other hand, he's seen the push attempt fail. He saw Mike's grab attempt fail. He saw Mike's kick attempt fail. Okay, his punch attempt failed. Brian's attempt to come back into the situation failed, so he's just thinking. He's contemplating his next action, so I'm going to take advantage of the situation and use a freestyle technique. So everything we've done here is at a yellow belt. We've upped the intensity, we've taken it to a higher level, a higher skill level, and we've taken these yellow belt techniques and worked them more on an advanced level. Okay, gentlemen, let's walk through it. Once again, we'll go just a little quicker. Push, grab, punch, he comes in, I finish, bam, freestyle, pop. Back into Chuck. Okay, come on up, gentlemen. Okay, we're going to take the situation once again, and we're going to do it like we need to do it on the street. Okay, I'd like to bring out one other point about this kind of practice, this kind of training, and that's environmental awareness. Yes, it's fun. Yeah, we're working our techniques, practicing the same moves over and over again, so forth and so on, but you're conditioning your mind to be a to be more prepared with aggression. Gentlemen, come on in. Now, in the beginning of the situation, from Brian's attack, go ahead and push. I've got all three of my attackers in frame, okay? I'm not concentrating just on Brian. I'm using my peripheral vision to keep all three of these attackers in frame, okay? And as you move from individual to individual and they get more spread out, uh, another thing you might think about doing is constantly scanning back and forth, okay? Scanning your environment watching these individuals from head to toe so you can pick up and predict the moves. If you let at any one point in time, gentlemen, just kind of crowd around me and so forth. Okay, if you let these guys close in too much on you, you're not going to have enough space between you and your attacker to react. Okay, he can grab. He's got me. The punch is coming in. Brian's right here. Okay, you can't handle this all at once. If the situation closes on you in this manner, you've got to back out and utilize the distance. Okay. But taking it the way that we did from the first one, I went back, okay, using my peripheral vision, okay, I can pick these guys apart as they come in. I'm using the distance. I used him as a shield, okay, piece by piece. I'm moving back and finish the job off. But at no point during this scenario did I concentrate on any one individual, okay. A phenomena that happens a lot when you're caught by surprise you're, or you're dealt or you're attacked uh, by aggressive individuals is a situation called tunnel vision, okay? And when tunnel vision occurs, and it does occur, the majority of time an individual is in a high stress confrontation that's unprepared, but when tunnel vision does occur, come on in, Brian, okay, your mind will focus on the initial aspect of the threat, the first instant of the threat, and everything else becomes blurred or totally obscured by a tunnel phenomena that occurs in your brain, okay? I would see Brian's attack but I wouldn't see what's around me, okay? Environmentally, all I could see was this. When Mike grabs, okay, I wouldn't even know he's there because I'm tunneled in on just Brian. And a way to, to, to defeat this is by training because you're conditioning your mind to be prepared for this type of aggression. And that's an important point when you're doing this. You need to be conscious that this is going on and the more you understand it, the more you can learn to deal with it. Thank you, gentlemen.
I'm Todd Boydston with this edition of Martial Arts Today. I'm joined today by Brian Dickerson, who's the staff instructor at the Tim Bulotz Academy of Kempo Karate. Brian's also a physiology major attending the University of Texas at Arlington. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Todd. Now, Brian, you teach a cardio kempo class at the Academy of Kempo Karate, is that correct? Correct. Now, tell me a little bit about cardio kempo. What exactly is this? Cardio kempo is, is designed as a, a fun and innovative type of exercise which uh, uh, utilizes uh, upper and lower body for a complete workout. Uh, we're going to use, we're learning self-defense techniques uh, and practice them in a relaxed and informal atmosphere. Um, it's designed as a, an a, aerobic workout uh, uh, that doesn't incur the boredom uh, of other types of exercise. Well, how would you say cardio kempo differs from, say, a standard uh, cardiovascular workout, uh, step aerobics or high impact aerobics, things like that? Well, this is designed as a, a high intensity workout, uh, utilizing the full body, uh, and uh, and we're learning self defense as we as we go. Now you do, um, I guess, punches, kicks, things like that. Sure. Uh, uh, a lot of the basic movements involved in martial arts, we'll take those, learn those, and uh, progress into the class um, uh, into some actual self-defense. Now, how does that work? I mean, do you, I guess, punch in the bag? If you say you're, a, you're someone who, uh, say, a female or something like that, and you don't want to get your hands roughed up, how does that work, uh, punch uh, on the bags? A lot of what we do, uh, a lot of what we do is, is done on the bags, but when, when we are working on the bags, the hands will be padded. I will wear gloves and, and the wrist will be protected to prevent that type of injury also. Well, as far as injuries are concerned, isn't this uh, pretty rough? I mean, you're, you're hitting people, things like that? Well, there's, there's, there's no more risk of injury in cardio kempo than any form of aerobic exercise. Um, there's, there's no physical contact with your partners, with your classmates. Uh, uh, any contact that you do will be on a bag and, and like I said, uh, will be well protected there. Now, cardio kempo workout, I mean, how thorough is it as compared to, say, some of the other sports or, or running, things like that? Uh, as aerobic type exercises go, uh, cardio karate is actually rated among one of the highest at uh, about 800 calories per hour. Wow. It's, uh, we're gonna, we'll start with some basic punches and kicks, but we're going to actually utilize the same self-defense techniques that are utilized in our regular karate classes. Uh, just we're going to work these in a different atmosphere. Really, you use the same techniques. I mean, is this a is this a really viable substitute for regular martial arts training? It's not really designed as a substitute for regular martial arts training. It's designed for those people who are looking for uh, looking for the opportunity to become more fit, uh, to enjoy themselves, and to learn some self defense without the uh, the traditional uh, karate classes with the belt testing and the tradition of martial arts. But what you're learning, can that be used on the street for self-defense? Uh, we're going to take these self-defense techniques and we're going to work them a variety of ways. Uh, uh, we're constantly changing to meet a variety of situations. We're going to work them up into the hundreds of times uh, to, to help these techniques to become second nature. Hmm. Well, why would you say choose uh, cardio kempo to say another form of exercise? Uh, be it bench aerobics, something like that. Why choose that? We're going to, uh, in cardio kempo, we will, uh, we're working a full body workout, getting the same, uh, at least the same amount of exercise, same form of exercise, uh, constantly changing, and, uh, and we're learning self defense as we go. Well, it makes sense to me. Well, let me ask you a question. Cardio Kempo and say aerobic kickboxing, I mean, are they basically the same things? You hear aerobic kickboxing everywhere. It seems to be the new craze. It's very similar and you, you see uh, aerobic kickboxing getting a lot more popular. Uh, cardio Kempo is, is designed, uh, you're going to see a lot of the same blocks, same punches, same kicks, uh, same, a lot of the same movements as aerobic kickboxing. And in Cardio Kempo, we're going to uh, take our Kempo self-defense techniques and utilize those in the class also. So it's like uh, aerobic kickboxing taken even a step further. With the self-defense of Kempo. Right? Well, that's great. I tell you, you, you convinced me I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. But 
Who else is there with me? Who, who else is training in cardio kempo? Uh, cardio there's karate? a variety of people in cardio karate. Uh, it's becoming very popular in the Hollywood set. A lot of the stars, such as Terry Hatcher, Paula Abdul, really? uh, downtown Julie Brown, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the more well-known people. Princess Di is known to really? uh, put this in her training regimen. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of people out there. It's become a very popular form of exercise. I tell you, it, it seems like that's uh, definitely the way to go, uh, exercise and self-defense training. Well, Brian, I certainly appreciate you joining me on Martial Arts Today and appreciate you coming and uh, joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time on the next edition of Martial Arts Today. Okay, for this week's episode of Modern Martial Arts, we visit Reading Martial Arts in Denton, Texas. Now, Mulane and I had a great time up there working with Mark uh, and his crew, as we always do when we, when we go to uh, Reading Martial Arts to, to visit or work out or teach, film, whatever we do up there. Mark's a friend and a student of mine going back to about 1994. He started training with me when he was 16 years old, and he's earned a uh, high rank in Kempo Karate and uh, uh, hats off to him because the man holds four black belts, okay, uh, including an instructorship in, in Jeet Kune Do uh, in the Filipino martial arts. And he was smart enough to get in on the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu game when it first made the scene here in the United States and has done quite well. And he's now a, a, a several year uh, third degree black belt uh, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with a lot of tournament competition to back that up and some titles to go along with that as well. But tonight, we're gonna to work on the Filipino martial arts in Jeet Kune Do. Mark is gonna take us through a, a series of traps. Good stuff for close range fighting here. Good, easy to learn, and very effective self-defense. Okay, so let's go now to Reading Martial Arts, and let's take a lesson from Mark on that close range trapping of Jeet Kune Do. Hey guys, I'm Mark Redding from Redding Martial Arts in Denton, Texas, and today we're going to work through some trapping sequences from Jeet Kune Do. Okay guys, so we're going to focus off of the jab and get to some trapping sequences. So we have Cedric here throwing the jab at us through the face, so we're going to parry that jab and we're going to do what we call goon team. It's going to hit on the inside of the bicep. So as I hit that on the inside of the bicep, that's going to give my distraction as I go for the back knuckle to the head. Cedric, skilled martial artist here, is going to catch that block or that back knuckle. So I'm going to come in. That sets me in my trapping sequence. So I'm going to grab the wrist. I'm going to put my elbow to his, and then there's the follow-up to the next back knuckle. Notice that both arms are trapped here. That gives me access to be able to grab to the head. So my hands are going to go, thumbs will be going to the eyes, but in training, we'll go across the eyebrows. So we'll go across the eyebrows, we'll grab the top of the head, and my headbutt's gonna come straight in. And we're hitting with the top of our head to the person's face. Then we'll slip the knee to the groin, and then I ricochet the head up as I slip the elbow to the face. Okay guys, again, we'll walk through this sequence. So as Cedric throws this jab at us, we're gonna parry this with the center knuckle, or we call goon team on the inside of the bicep. So as I hit that, causing some pain, I go for the back knuckle and he catches it. That's gonna give me my trap sequence. So my left hand comes under, elbow to elbow, pinning that as I give another back knuckle to the head. Gives me access to the face now, so my thumbs will go across the eyebrows, in reality they'll be in the eyes, okay? I'm gonna pull his head to the top of my head, not straight on. So I put the top of my head to his head, and I slip the knee to the groin, and I pull his head up as I shoot the elbow to his face. Okay guys, let's look at this at a little more live speed. So I just throw the jab. Okay guys, we're gonna look at the second sequence in this trapping series in Jeet Kune Do. And this time, my partner Cedric is going to not cross the center line. So what that means is as Cedric throws that jab, I'm hitting on the inside like we were doing before, but this time he catches the arm a little bit too far away. So this would be crossing the center line, this is not crossing the center line. So I can't run all the way over here and grab this wrist to trap it, so we have to trap it on the inside now. So what that means is if my right side is forward, I will step through with my left, checking knee to knee, as I take my left hand and give a parry on the inside of his arm which will block both the arms, and this is the trap from here. So then there's my punch, which would go to the chest or the face, 
And the ending still be the same. I grab through the eyes, I headbutt, I would knee, and I would slip the elbow. Okay guys, let's look at sequence number two from the JKD trapping series, okay? So Cedric's gonna throw that jab at me. We're gonna give that parry, we're gonna hit the center knuckle on the inside of the arm, just like we did before. But this time as I go for the back knuckle, Cedric catches my hand a little bit further away. He's not crossing the center line. So we have to be able to trap that. It doesn't make sense to come around and grab the wrist. So we need to step in or a step shuffle in. My knee's gonna check to his knee. My left hand's gonna pair it the arm across. So let's see, my left arm is blocking or checking both of his arms. I don't have my arm up high. My right hand can get the punch to the face or the chest, which still gives me access to the head. So there's my head butt, there's my knee, and then there's my elbow finish. Okay guys, let's look at this a little bit more of a live speed. So if Cedric throws the jab, I'm gonna block, come across, the butt, knee, slip the elbow. Okay guys, so let's look at option number three in this JKD trapping series. So Cedric's gonna throw the same jab, all these off the same entry, so it's easier to remember. So this time, what's gonna happen is, I'm gonna come through with the goon team, okay? And I can eye jab this way, or I can leave it on the inside. So a lot of people will just come in and glance off of this and go right for the eye jab, okay? If you notice, his arm is over the shoulder, so it's easy to be able to lock this down on wrench. So what I'm doing is pretend you have a watch on, you're covering that watch, and we're just pulling him close to us. As I do that, my head lowers, the top of my head hits his face, okay? From there, I want to control this bicep. So we're taking the shoulder, we're putting it to his chin. This is more from Dumog in the Philippine martial arts. And we're shoving that straight up to his face. As he starts to walk back, we'll give a sabat kick right to the chest. And that'll be our entry for this technique. Okay guys, let's take a look at this third sequence again in the JKD trapping. So the Cedric throws that jab at us, right? So we're gonna glance right off the inside of the bicep. So this is really a distraction, but we are hitting that eye jab. So it's gonna come up to the eye like this, and then my hand is gonna cover, and I'm gonna pull him straight down. Notice how my head goes to his face, not head to head, all right, to protect yourself. My right hand comes around like a flower and it's going to grab the bicep. I'm taking the shoulder and putting it to his chin. Give him a little walk backwards. All right, this is from Dumog in the Filipino martial art. Then my right leg is going to go for a sabat type kick to the chest. And we'll finish with the sequence from there. All right, so look at a different angle. So this side here, if Cedric goes that punch, glance right to the eyes, give the pull. Okay, I'm going to push the shoulder to him as he walks back. There's the chest shot. Let's look at it at this side. Okay, so as he comes in with that jab, parry, eye jab, pull him down to the headbutt, give him a push, walk him out, kick to the chest. Let's do one more on this up here. Good. Okay, jab comes in, eye jab, wrench, shoulder, right to the chest. Okay guys, let's look at sequence number four in the JKD trapping series. So this time, remember what I was saying, the entry's the same, but our follow-ups are a little bit different. So as Cedric throws that jab, we're still gonna come across him on the inside. You can do open hand, or you can do center knuckle, okay? So either one, I come through, and that's gonna be my eye jab. 
That eye jab is just set up so that person starts to kind of get stuttered and backwards, back up a little bit. So as that happens, I'm going to continue on with my straight blast. Most of the time you'll get about two, possibly three hits in and these hands start to come up and give you a wall. That is the trapping. That's what we have to clear to to get to the neck. So the hand will come to the elbow again like we've been doing in the previous movements. My left hand can come across and then I'm right back into the same thing we have finished before. Just we're adding a straight blast to it. Let's look at this angle over here. So as Cedric comes in, again, I come through, there's the eye jab, right? And from that hand, my left hand can throw that punch. Look, you'll get that shot in. My right hand throws that punch. Hands will start to come up, he doesn't want to get hit. He's been hit three times already. The hand checks, I go right back into that sequence that we were at. On this side, jab comes in, eye jab. One, two, I clear that wall, breaking that down so I can get the finish with the headbutts, knees and elbows. Okay guys, thank you for joining us on our segment on modern martial arts with Jeet Kune Do, trapping and entrances and sequences into that art. Okay, if you guys wanna visit us on our website at readingmartialarts.com or welcome to come and visit our school in Denton, Texas. Our number is 940-891-6000. We'd love to have you here to join us. All right, that's gonna do it for tonight. That's gonna to wrap up episode nine. How about those head butts, knees, and elbows? Good close range fighting stuff there. And also I'd like to thank uh, George Porolsky for giving us that uh, 1996 explanation uh, of the Los Cotas of Judo. That's some, some fascinating stuff. I tell you, I, I, I wouldn't want to get Judo thrown to the ground. Um, uh, those guys were hitting the mat, no doubt. So anyway, be sure and like the channel, subscribe to the channel, share the channel, whatever you can do to help us out. It's always appreciated. We're going to keep working at this. We got one more episode to wrap up uh, uh, season one. That'll be episode 10. Should have that out for y'all next week. So remember, if you're not training, you ought to be, and if you're not training at Weapons Academy, come check us out and see what we're doing. Y'all take care out there. We'll see you next week for episode 10 of Training to Survive. Viewer questions or comments should be directed to Tim Bulot's Academy of Kenpo Karate, 3325 West Rochelle Road, Irving, Texas, 75062, or give us a call at Metro 972-256-3969.